But I also think that if you look at the history of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, for that matter, you can find that both immortality and resurrection are there. They're not necessarily contradictory to each other. Baptism actually freed us from the terms of that covenant and uh, made us uh, a son of God rather than a son of, of uh, the evil powers uh, of, of the world. Dynamic biblical discussions with special guests exploring tough biblical issues, academic scholarship, ethics, archaeology, textual criticism, Old Testament, New Testament, Bible interpretation, apocalyptic literature, Christian history, ancient Near East cultures. You're tuned in to Conversations with Pastor Cliff on Peluso Ministries. Good day, everybody. Welcome back to another episode on Conversations with Pastor Cliff. And today we are hosting wonderful guests, two wonderful guests from uh, Harvard Divinity School. Uh, one uh, of our guests is Kevin Madigan. And uh, another guest is someone that you are quite familiar with. You've seen him, we've had him before on this platform. And his name is Professor John Levinson. And uh, both of them have written a book called uh, uh, The Resurrection the power of God for both Christians and Jews. So it is a, a, a wonderful topic that we'll be covering today. So welcome back. Welcome back, uh, John, and welcome, Kevin, onto your platform. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Pastor Cliff. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I saw it fitting that, uh, you know, this topic is quite a very uh, intriguing uh, topic, uh, particularly for both Christians and Jews. And I thought we can sort of uh, talk about it today and expand your views on how you actually arrived at even writing this book together. And uh, you can share some insights, I believe, on this uh, on this conversation with some of our audiences so they can learn a lot from us and from, from this conversation in general. Um, and just before we get into the actual conversation, I'd like you to uh, just to give a bit of background, you know, each of you at, as to who you are and what has sort of inspired you to do this type of work that you're doing. And yeah, what has led you to actually even writing this book uh, uh, itself? I think, I think the younger man should go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, <all> right. <laughs> well, Cliff, after uh, graduating from college, I went to, to the University of Chicago Divinity School uh, to begin my studies in uh, religion. And this was 1984. And the first classroom that I walked into uh, was a class on uh, the sacred scriptures of the West. And the uh, professor at the front of the room was John Levinson <laughs> here with us. Um, and so I've known I John. Minus, I, might add, I was minus 14 at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, while at Chicago, I uh, really uh, studied uh, medieval Christianity and to a lesser extent, uh, ancient Christianity. Um, and came to Harvard in 2000, uh, I think some 12 years or so after John arrived. And by then I had developed uh, my interest in the history of Judaism, particularly the ancient Judaism, modern Judaism. And uh, since uh, then, John and I have been um, friends and colleagues and we've collaborated on uh, this book and, and a number of other projects. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I majored in English in college. Uh, which I think Kevin also did, if I'm not mistaken. I did. I did, yeah. And uh, I, uh, I was increasingly absorbed existentially and uh, intellectually in Judaism. So I decided to do a doctorate in a certain area that I saw as an area of Jewish studies, namely uh, biblical studies, originally uh, Semitics, Northwest Semitics, uh, comparative uh, Semitics. So I uh, received a doctorate in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations uh, at uh, Harvard. And ever since then, I've taught at various schools in uh, uh, areas of uh, ancient Judaism. Uh, some courses deal a little bit with medieval uh, materials, which I don't know much about. And even uh, I even have a course I'm giving now, to give a number of times, on uh, uh, 20th century Jewish uh, theologians. Uh, but uh, Kevin and I have known each other, as I said, since 1984, and uh, uh, we. Uh, we decided that this would be a good project for the two of us to do together. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I mean, I know, John, you wrote a book that we had a chat about it on our platform in, in 2006. And uh, just to backtrack, what has motivated you to actually collaborate and write this book? Uh, you know, I know the topics are, are pretty much uh, almost similar, uh, if not. Right 
yeah what 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 inspired the move to to go to well um when that book came out resurrection and the restoration of israel the ultimate triumph of the god of life uh, my editor at yale university press suggested that i write a more accessible book uh less scholarly uh but still intellectually uh honest and compelling about resurrection in uh, the religions of the world well not all religions of the world have resurrection I'm, i'm sure they all even have immortality but resurrection is a very specific thing uh, i decided that was just too big and far beyond my uh, competence uh, but i thought that what might it be a bad idea would be to talk about uh, judaism and christianity especially since they have a a, a common origin and they uh, share certain uh, texts including certain important texts i talked about in the earlier book so i ran this idea past kevin and we decided that we would jointly author a book uh my part was easier to write than his because it involved just a kind of reprocessing of my uh, earlier chapters making them more accessible and less technical uh, and then his part involved the original compositions having to deal with the new testament and early christianity and uh, what uh, resurrection meant in general what resurrection of, Je- of jesus in specific meant and how this is then implemented in the in the christian life okay uh, i think uh if we 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 zoom in quite a little bit, uh, quite in detail we would know that you know resurrection is quite a big deal in in the christian era um especially in the christian religion itself and this would be more like a, a particular interest for you kevin because you did a lot more with history um and what i want to ask you essentially is where did the belief in the resurrection emanate from um because we see it developing and John does cover it in some of his work and you 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 do a great job of at covering it on in, on your book that you co-authored together but where would you say the the belief in the resurrection emanated from um well uh, th- thanks for that question cliff um it connects uh, to another question uh that you gave us uh ahead of time which um has to do with some of the uh potential misunderstandings or uh uh misconceptions of what christianity is uh which i found to be and perhaps you find to be pretty common among uh baptized uh christians for example um uh, i think the most common understanding of re- resurrection in the churches that i know is that resurrection is uh, identical with immortality or life after death or that it it resurrection and the survival of our souls or some uh spiritual core after the deaths of our bodies uh and so forth um and i i used to be wrong or uh partial uh, and so um i decided to um try and put uh the idea of resurrection in the context uh that john put it in um namely in uh late second temple judaism uh in the imaginative cosmos and in the literature of second temple Judaism and so forth and uh it's from there i think that john proves uh that um that the idea of resurrection uh came from and so having accepted that i went on to talk uh in the book a little bit about how jesus and his contemporaries uh, contemporary jews imagined resurrection and how Paul imagined resurrection. So uh as you yourself know Cliff uh this is really a product of again late uh second temple Judaism not that uh all Jews uh, believed it uh but certainly Jesus of Nazareth um Pharisees uh and 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 others uh did believe it including perhaps uh, uh the sectarians at uh, Qumran. Okay you keep uh, uh repeating this word second temple of Judaism I don't know if many of our viewers may be familiar with that or uh, with that that term would you flesh it out a little bit to just to you know briefly what 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 we mean by second temple Judaism Sure I I might uh I might if it's okay Cliff just uh, uh kick that question over to John just because he's a bit more of a specialist and that I can take Oh, <laughs> sure, it's coming now. Uh, yeah, I mean the the second temple in Jerusalem was built after the first one had been destroyed, uh, rebuilt around 515 before the common era and was then destroyed some 600 years later in the year 70 the common era by the Romans. So, uh broadly speaking, you could say the second temple period runs from the late 6th century BCE through uh two-thirds uh, of the way through the first century CE 
Uh, but usually when people are talking about second temple, they're usually talking about something from, oh, I don't know, 300 before the common era till 70 of the common era, something like that. And there's a, a rich variety of sources, uh, some in Hebrew, some in Aramaic, uh, some in Greek, uh, about the, uh, the Jewish religious life at the time. And the truth is that Judaism, as it survives over the century and evolves over the century, uh, is descended from certain movements um, late in that Second Temple period. And Christianity is also descended from uh, Second Temple Judaism. In other words, in a certain sense, the two are better seen as siblings with a common ancestor, which is Second Temple Judaism, which it in turn has an ancestor in the religion of religions of the Hebrew Bible, ancient Israelite religion, which is even earlier, which is what dominates through most of the Hebrew Bible, or as Christians call it, uh, the Old Testament. It was a colleague, a former colleague of Kevin's, I think, at Catholic Theological Union in uh, Chicago, Chaim Perlmutter, who said that Jews and Christianity are not so much mother and daughter, they're siblings, but their common ancestor is itself a form of Judaism, namely Second Temple Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism and Christianity, in a certain sense, descend from uh, Second Temple Judaism. Fantastic. And they, inherit, they inherit this idea of resurrection of the dead from certain parties, certain factions or parties or streams of thought in Second Temple Judaism. Great. Uh, well, I think that answers a lot of questions. Um, now, I want to you know, add another question to that. Um, I mean, Kevin touched a little bit on it. Uh, as to say that you focus on the wet sheol um, also heavily in your book uh, as, as your, your starting point to sort of clarify how this word was used and how uh, uh, people can get a better understanding of how it was used uh, then. Now, why did you pick this approach to you know, start off with this word sheol to give a better perspective on how it was used? Well, sheol is a kind of mysterious Hebrew word. You don't really see good cognates with it in other languages. It refers to the dark, dank, literally God-abandoned netherworld. Uh, and the conventional view, which I think still probably dominates in the literature, is that in the Hebrew Bible, that's the destination of everyone. Everyone ends up at death uh, going to Sheol. Uh, we in this book strongly side with the minority that maintains that although Sheol is a critical aspect of the biblical understanding of death, uh, not everyone was thought to end up there. Um, the way I put it is, Sheol is the continuation of the unfulfilled life. What is the unfulfilled life? It's a life in which one dies violently, in which one dies childlessly, without child, without continuation in progeny, uh, in which one is not, or in which one is not buried in the family tomb, uh, laid to laid to rest with one's uh, fathers, uh, or sleeping with one's fathers, as the Bible puts it. Uh, or maybe even one dies uh, punitively, uh, violently, punitively, prematurely, without a proper burial, without descendants, etc. That's the unfulfilled life. And I think that's generally what, what who goes to show in the Bible. Uh, the fulfilled life is also a reality. There are people like Abraham and Jacob and Job who are said to have ended their lives full of days and contented, uh, having uh, lived a, a long life, having had seen their descendants, the third and the fourth generation. And uh, I don't see any reason to think those people were thought to then to have gone to Sheol. In other words, those biblical accounts of people dying fulfilled, seeing their and their descendants being buried in the family tomb. Uh, I don't see any reason to think that those people were then thought one second later after they die to have gone to the dark, dank, miserable underworld. Uh, I think that uh, the fulfilled life simply came to an end. It's not that they went to heaven or the Garden of Eden or anything like that, such as a paradise, such as you have in rabbinic Judaism and in Christianity. I think their life ended fulfilled. Their life is unfulfilled and, and, and ends tragically or violently with disruption. And that's who goes to Sheol. That's why you have time and again uh, psalmists pleading with God not to send them to Sheol. Or even if they do, even if they do send a Sheol to, to ransom them from Sheol, to bring them up from Sheol, they're in distress. Sheol, I think, is a destination of people uh, in distress. I'm not saying you couldn't find a, a, a verse here or there that would contradict what I just said, but by and large, I think that's that, that's the uh, the point. I, I'm, we're trying to counteract this idea that's very common, still around, that uh, the Hebrew Bible had no expectation of uh, of a 
of a blessed death because it didn't have a heaven after death. Uh, everybody was in terror of death and because everybody went to that miserable Hades-like underworld. I, I don't think that's the case. Okay, and, and Kevin, uh, do you also did you pick up some other things as you were you know, developing this uh, concept of Sheol, how you approach it in the, in the Hebrew Bible itself and how it would have developed historically? Is that what you also picked out in your work? Well, I guess um, not really, but um, uh, Cliff, the one thing that I did uh, really pick out or really kind of learn uh, in the course of my research uh, for this book is that uh, resurrection in Second Temple Judaism and in early Christianity was not simply about uh, bodies uh, popping out of graves. Um, it was much, much broader than that uh, in many ways. Um, so, for example, um, uh, as you know, and as I said in the book, um, it's an eschatological event and it's an apocalyptic event, right? Um, uh, one that uh, uh, Jews and Christians expected uh, to occur uh, very soon. Uh, but again, it involved not just the resurrection of, uh, of, a, of a body, uh, a body and a soul, uh, but it involved uh, the transformation of uh, the natural world, uh, the ingathering of the uh, lost tribes of Israel, um, the reconstruction of the temple, um, the, recre the recreation of the entire cosmos, really. So it was really, it really marked um, a shift in the eons, uh, as Paul might have put. Um, and um, Jesus' role in this, uh, at least according to his believers and perhaps even to himself, was uh, to be the final apocalyptic prophet to bring, to usher in this last stage of, uh, of God's plan. John, am I forgetting any of the uh, elements of uh, restoration eschatology that are involved? Well, that's very good. That's very yeah. good. You put it very, very well. It's a uh, renewal of, of the cosmos. It's a redemptive act. It's not just some way of avoiding death. It doesn't avoid death. Resurrection assumes death is real, unlike immortality of the soul. Death is real. There is something to fear in death. And then, there, and then finally, God takes possession of the world and acts in the world according to his reputation for justice and fairness and faithfulness to those who have been faithful to him. Okay. And so there, there, there is there's an, the resurrection of the dead is an event. It's an expected event that occurred at the end of time. Some groups thought the end of time was very near. Some didn't. But... Uh, uh, that, that was the focus. If you, if you detar detach it from eschatology in general, from the end times in general, I think you misunderstand what it is, especially if you, did, if you disconnect it from those things and then make it into kind of like, well, where am I going to go when I die? Or am I going to go to heaven? Or what's going to be like there? You've already, in a certain sense, gotten off on the wrong foot and, and, and uh, missed the biblical richness and traditional uh, theological richness of this doctrine. Okay, I, I think you also develop a uh, a significant theme of the, the the temple theme in your in your book, and that theme becomes like the anchor where everything sort of plugs in into, and which goes on to the immo immortality and also individual resurrection and the ultimate resurrection of the community. How do you distinguish uh, between you know immortality of the soul versus Im uh, communal Im uh, resurrection? And also um, uh, this whole concept of uh, resurrection of the dead. Uh, could you sort of distinguish between the three? Because I know they all hinge on this anchor in the trust in God, but built in into the, the, uh, the theme of the temple. Well, resurrection of the dead is, uh, assumes that people really do die. And to put it crudely, it's a reanimation of a corpse. It's a whole person, not a disembodied spirit, not a ghost. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's the whole person uh, coming back miraculously. It's, it's not scientifically possible, uh, and uh, so people who think the laws of science are absolute and prescriptive, and there can never be an exception, and even God can't interrupt them. Well, we have to reject a belief like this. Immortality of the soul just says some part of me, some invisible part of me, is a, is a, I think uh, Kevin called it a core, uh, a kind of indestructible core. The death cannot touch, death can only touch the body. 
But resurrection uh, assumes that the human being, a full hu human being, is more, more than just a disembodied uh, spirit uh, encased in, in some unfortunate uh, flesh that, at least in my case, keeps getting older and frailer with the years, uh, not, not yours. Uh, and, uh, uh, but th it's very different. The resurrection presupposes a kind of uh, renewal of the body and a restoration of the body and the restoration of, of people in community. I mean, the, the, the promise of restoration in the Hebrew Bible is very much connected to the promise of the restoration of the people of Israel and uh, uh, national redemption. And in the context of the Hebrew Bible, you can't say much about the God of Israel without also speaking about the people of Israel. And so there's a, a communal collective dimension that you wouldn't have with the immortality of the soul. That's a much more individualistic uh, vision. So I think there's a, a critical difference. Now, having said that, I've gone on too long. I'll ask Kevin to, to add to this uh, or refute it. Uh, but I also think that if you look at the history of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, for that matter, you can find that both immortality and resurrection are, are there. They're not necessarily contradictory to each other. As a person could die, and their spirit, their soul could be taken on by God, you know, could be a, a presence of God, and they, they live, so to speak, there until the critical moment at the end of time when there's a resurrection of the dead and they're reclothed in the, in the flesh and come back as a full embodied person. You can have both immortality and resurrection. They're not contradictory. Okay. And yeah, and. Um... Just to uh, add on that, Cliff, I, I think um, what you just said about uh, the people of Israel is uh, equally true for the um, early Christian church. So if we think about Paul for a moment, um, the uh, significance of Jesus' resurrection is not depleted uh, simply by the fact of his individual resurrection. In other words, for Paul, that resurrection he himself is, of course, a probably a Pharisaic Jew, but resurrection was a collective uh, or communal event. And so Jesus' resurrection is obviously uh, critically important. Um, it transfers us from the realm of death to the realm of life. Uh, it changes our sonships and so forth. It's very, very significant. Uh, but on the other hand, as he says, it, these are the first fruits, right, of what uh, a larger community uh, will experience uh, at the end of time. That, that, that's, that's very interesting that you put, that you say that, yeah, because it's, I think verbatim he says this is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep, which would mean those who have died. Uh, right, 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 right. Uh, um, and we talked a little bit uh, about this in the book, but um, some scholars uh, have really talked about early Christianity as either as Israel or as an Israel-like body. And I think in this sense, uh, that, that's, that's really quite, this is, as in other senses, that's really quite true. Um, and one of the uh, fun parts of the research for me uh, was to see um, how much uh, interpretation of the resurrection uh, from let's say the second and third century fathers was really based on uh, ideas, uh, narratives that were found primarily in the Hebrew Bible, which uh, as John has pointed out in a number of his books was, was the only Bible the uh, Christians had at least until what 180 or 200 or so. Um, even if we think about Jesus himself uh, and the way in which Matthew constructs uh, his gospel, he, he Jesus enters uh, Jerusalem, uh, right? on an ass um, or on, on a donkey um, and named as king. Oh, wait, 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 which, which is it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it Actually, a donkey. <laughs> I, think, I think in Matthew 21, they take, they take literally the poetic parallelism of Zechariah 9.9 and have Jesus, if I'm not mistaken, riding on two animals at once. Yeah. Zechariah 9.9 literally. And that's quite that, true, actually. Right. That is quite true. So he rides a donkey and the young of a donkey at the same time. Yes. <laughs> but I, I, I think uh, Jesus uh, may have imagined himself uh, to have been the, that king promised uh, in Zechariah, or certainly Matthew, the evangelist, uh, uh, did so as well. Um, 
also really quite interesting to me was the way in which um, baptism, for example, in Paul, we'll get to this later. I know this is not a question you want to ask right now, Cliff, but in terms of practical living out resurrection, I'll just give an example or two uh, that uh, some of the uh, ritual activities in baptism, uh, like exorcism or so the oil uh, that is applied uh, in exorcism were imagined in terms that could only have been taken from the Hebrew Bible. So that in that particular case, the oil was imagined as the blood, which was spread on the uh, lintels and doorposts, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in Exodus uh, and uh, in Passover. Um, that is to say, they made, they made the uh, catechumen uh, about to become a Christian safe uh, and protected him from uh, the evildoer. Okay, that's quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, so you they kind of change what was in 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 historically either blood and to to oil. That's kind of very yeah interesting. yeah. Um, they, read, and, they read the Hebrew Bible typologically. Yeah, to events, certain events. So so it's a kind of midrashic development or kind of interpretation of of for them what is the only scriptures they have in in a, in a new direction. But can I, Cliff? Can I go back to a question you you raised about the, the temple and the temple yes. theme? This, yeah, the reason we stress uh, the temple is in the in the Hebrew Bible, as as in the ancient Near East more generally, the temple had strong associations with uh, the ideal life, the ideal world, uh, paradise, a place of deathlessness. Uh, it's in Psalm one thirty three, it's speaking about Zion, the Temple Mount, where the Dome of the Rock stands today. It says, "There, the Lord ordained blessing, eternal life." Uh, as a life in the temple is a kind of foretaste especially as the rabbis of the early Talmudic literature saw it, life in the temple is a kind of foretaste of the world to come. I mean, it's a, it's a life that stands in contradiction to the world of discord, false accusation, insufficiency, uh, you know, need, the hunger that exists outside the gates. It's a world of fullness and safety. Uh, and uh, consider this 23rd Psalm where, the, where really the psalmist wishes he could uh, live in the Talmud uh, live, live, excuse, live in the temple all the days of his life. So the temple was a place of refuge for the just and uh, a locus for the vision of God. It was a place where uh, the, uh, the, the unfairly accused found safety and vindication. So strong aspects of that then carry over in the discussions of the world to come or the, the post-resurrection world, olam about the world to come in, in rabbinic Hebrew. So I, I really think that there's some kind of predecessor to or placeholder for notions of the world to come and of post-resurrection ex existence already in the mythos of, of temples in the ancient Near East. And by temples, I mean palaces for the god and the place where god, the god imagined as a king uh, receives the homage and the service and the gifts uh, of, of his uh, uh, votaries. And uh, uh, that has strong connections with the way in which uh, the world to come is uh, is conceived. Okay. That, yeah, that... and in, even in Paul, uh, when Paul is giving, uh, let's say, ethical advice, um, he talks about our bodies as as being temples or in Israelite history uh, sanctuaries of the Lord, and because they are holy places. To ensure that we keep bringing you tough and, conversations uh, like these. Please support our ministry by donating as little as 50 rand per month. You can find our banking details on our website, pulusoministries.co.za. Okay, and, and backtracking on that, uh, Kevin, that you touched on it, uh, some people may argue that uh, when God, you know, breathed into this first man, Adam, uh, the, the 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 nefesh meaning to say that he became a living being some some would be reading a translation not reading a the the source text itself um and they would say that man is a is a it's a living soul so to speak more like in a greek kind of mythology and mm -hmm. hence the the understanding of man then becomes this immortal being after death which sort of cancels out the whole concept of the resurrection as you point out that some of the 
um, um, early Christians and Jews would have rejected this idea of the resurrection, while some saw it as a, something that is crucial to their faith. And, and, and why do you have these sort of opposing views, uh, you know, at play, um, um, you know, contradicting the resurrection itself? What would you say are some of the contributing factors? Uh, right, yeah. Um, I, I think the fundamental difference between some of these groups, um, some of whom we might find as early as uh, 1 Corinthians or uh, in the letters of Ignatius of Antioch and so forth, but who are generally called, uh, called by the umbrella term of Gnostics, um, um, about whom we know from both the second and third century Christian fathers, but since 1947 from the Nag Hammadi Library, I'm sure you uh, all know. But um, I, I think the essential distinction between the Gnostics and uh, the early Christians uh, is this cosmological sense on the part of the Gnostics. I think it's based on interpretation of uh, the story of the fall that um, there were some primordial hiccup in, in what you and I would call creation, uh, or that creation was the product of uh, a lesser God or a malevolent God. And so the point was for them, the point of religion for them was to escape this uh, evil material realm. So where Christians and Jews affirmed that uh, creation is good, uh, Gnostics affirmed uh, the, uh, the precise opposite. Um, one of the corollaries of belief that the creation is evil um, is uh, that, uh, you know, we need to uh, understand uh, flesh and matter as, as fundamentally incompatible. So in all sorts of ways, uh, they felt that um, the flesh was something to be escaped from, that, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the true God uh, created only the soul, right, and not the flesh. Um, even when they come around to talking about Jesus of Nazareth, they think that he did not take on a real body, but perhaps a phantasmal human body, uh, or put it on because that's the way a God needs to operate in, uh, on Earth, just in the way a, an astronaut would put on a spacesuit uh, to, right, because that's how you need to operate in, in outer space. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, uh, they concluded that only uh, the pneumatic, uh, right, only the pneumatic would survive death, only uh, the spiritual, first of all, first of all only a, a, a minority <laughs> would survive, only the Gnostic, the, the wise man, uh, would survive, um, and that resurrection, that survival was only of the spirit, uh, right? Um, so they're really deviating from the Christian conviction that um, the, the, the body would resurrect body, uh, the individual would resurrect body and soul. Okay. okay. That's and if I could add, that's one of the reasons why some or all of them had a, a strong distaste for the Hebrew Bible, yeah. for Jews in general. Yeah. They saw the creator God as some sort of deficient demiurge, the real God they associated with their Christian message, could never have created this mucky, messy world, and certainly not get involved in, in matters like human reproduction and choose a natural family like the people of Israel, even a natural family with a supernatural mission like the, uh, like the Jewish uh, people. So uh, as I recall, uh, Kevin can speak to this better than I can, uh, Marcion in the mid second century comes up with his own canon, uh, which is, certain, I guess, certain sections of Paul and the kind of redone Gospel of Luke and no uh, Hebrew Bible at all. Mm -hmm. Nothing what soon would be called Old Testament, not maybe not yet called Old Testament, uh, would be taken at all because it all speaks to that fleshly, carnal world and, and, and the real God can have, couldn't have anything to do with that. That's right. That's right. He actually believed that the uh, Hebrew Bible or Old Testament or Septuagint actually revealed a different God and that the New Testament, uh, of which he created the sort of truncated version that John just described exactly, uh, revealed a different God, the God of Jesus Christ, and that those were simply two, two different gods, the former responsible for the creation of this um, unfortunate universe and the latter 
really the source of salvation. Yeah, um, I think you touch on a very um, crucial subject because uh, Mar Marcion himself, uh, I mean, would have tried to eliminate anything that is viewed as uh, this anti Jesus, uh, as people would, would perceive in the New Testament reading, but not taking into account that Jesus himself would have been a, a student of the Hebrew Bible. That's all he had. <laughs> on his right. reading. He yeah. would have read and, and, and taught from uh, in, the, in the Jesus movement. So, yeah, I think there's something crucial that you bring out so that you cannot have uh, Jesus's words uh, apart from the, the, the Hebrew Bible itself. So I think th those are some of the That's misconceptions right. that we have today in the modern church. Um, you know, Jesus has more like a higher voice compared to the text that would have governed his life as a Hebrew uh, a boy or a Hebrew, you know, a Hebrew teacher or rabbi at the time. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. There is a theme that keeps coming up in the history of the church that is yeah. to get rid of the Old Testament, to play it down, to see it as superseded, uh, it connects to certain anti-Semitic themes, uh, Christian superstitions, and the the Jewish people were placed by the church and so forth. It comes up time, time, from time to time, and, and even even in, in recent years, there was some sort of controversy in Germany a couple of years ago, where some prominent uh, theologian made statements to that effect. Uh, it, it is a, a theme that crops up uh, over the centuries, time and again, in, uh, in church history. That's it. Fantastic. So now, if I may ask, uh, how does then this uh, whole notion of the resurrection apply to modern day, uh, say, Jews and Christians in terms of how to, to apply their lives in terms of the, the here and now and what is to come in the, you know, the, the future life in, in the resurrection? How, how ethically and ethics wise, you know, what are some of the, the things that, you know, one can use in terms of, um, you know, in, the eschatological hope and also the here and now. You can go, Kevin, uh, now because I'm uh, going to go for it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, um, sure. Um, well, um, one uh, pretty consistent teaching of the uh, fathers who taught about uh, uh, the res resurrected life, particularly in connection with baptism in the early church was that one was, as they uh, characteristically put it, to be what one had become. So, um, and here their thought, um, and actually baptism, all the ritual baptism is really pervaded, uh, thoroughly, profoundly pervaded uh, by uh, thoughts, uh, key concepts from, from the gospel of Paul. Um, and I can talk if you like about how that ritual uh, was intended to work, but it was certainly, uh, it was certainly the way in which uh, one could begin to anticipate uh, resurrection uh, even before death. Uh, it was, of course, the induction ceremony, uh, but it was also a, uh, you know, it was the time which oh, Paul talks all the time in these antinomies or antitheses, um, right, uh, where one one sonship uh, was changed or where one changed one's covenant, uh, right? That we were all locked in a covenant with uh, the evil powers, but, uh, but that uh, baptism actually freed us from the terms of that covenant and uh, made us uh, a son of God rather than a son of, of uh, the evil powers uh, of, of, of the world. Uh, um, and all of the all of the uh, bodily movements of the uh, baptismal ritual were designed to reinforce that change in status, if that's the right word. Um, uh, so, uh, for example, um, during the uh, baptismal ceremony, one was first to be. Uh, first to face west to the occident or to uh, the place of uh, darkness and then then oriented literally turned east towards the uh, realm of light and the uh, locus of all the uh, saving acts uh, in divine history i think though the some of the most interesting uh, uh, parts of the ritual in which pauline theology uh, comes through very, very strongly is in the actual immersion of the catechumen, him or herself. So, um, and here, 
uh, the, the rituals connected to Paul's kind of critical categories of uh, absorption and assimilation and so forth. So uh, as you undoubtedly know, Cliff, in the early church, uh, a candidate, first of all, uh, the, the baptism would occur um, uh, between the Easter vigil and on Sunday. Uh, when the candidate uh, was uh, immersed into the water, he or she was immersed uh, without clothing and immersed three times. And uh, there's no doubt that behind this is the notion that uh, of Paul that you're crucified. Uh, you're actually, uh, in a sense, uh, mystically uh, put to death under one of the elements of the earth three times, right, to mirror Jesus's three days in the tomb, but then you ascend again, uh, just as, and then you participate, right, uh, in uh, Christ's, uh, Christ's ascension and resurrection and so forth, and then you're incorporated into the body of Christ. All these metaphors, incorporation, participation, very, very, very important, okay, um, and welcomed into the promised land of God's salvation. You're given tokens of oil and honey to remind you uh, enter uh, or have entered the, the promised land. You're also given a tunic, right? A white tunic to symbolize uh, the change in your status, right? Um, uh, you're now uh, pure. Uh, and again, um, where we get, um, uh, let's say, um, paranetic uh, teaching on this, the, um, this, the uh, center of, of uh, the, this central point is you have been baptized. Do not go back and live among the dead, by which they mean uh, the sinful. Uh, and here, interestingly, the figure is of Lazarus, Lazarus, excuse me, is often invoked. So where Jesus from Nazareth rises and will never die again, Lazarus, uh, as John talked about in his other book, is brought back to life, but then dies again. And uh, so teachers uh, warned them that you could be like Lazarus. Um, so uh, there was still a, a sense in which, um, although you had been uh, um, uh, what uh, delivered, uh, delivered from slavery, and here again, Exodus is in the background, um, and restored to splendor, uh, pre-lapsarian splendor, and there uh, the Garden of Eden uh, is in the background, you could fall back. Uh, there is this sense that, um, that uh, you still have to, uh, to use the modern phrase, walk the walk uh, to remain as a Christian, to remain among the saved, I should say. Fantastic. Um, I think in, in terms of the continuing Jewish tradition, I don't think there's nearly as much focus on the resurrection of the dead. A lot of modern Jews think there is no such idea in Judaism. I think it's because if you just say something like the resurrection in an English speaking uh, culture, they assume you're talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And then the, the notion of the general eschatological resurrection of the dead, when Hebrews called chiatamitim, the reanimation of the, of the dead, uh, that's not well known among many Jews unless they're. Uh, observant and very traditional, they probably don't even see it in their liturgy. They see statements saying God animates everything or brings life to all or whatever, which are kind of circumlocutions to avoid dealing with the miraculous intervention of God at the end time, which is the classical rabbinic doctrine of the resurrection of, uh, of the dead. <clears throat> and even among the Orthodox, my observation is they say those words, God is faithful to the Chayot team. <coughs> Uh, to bring the dead back to life, uh, and they will describe God as uh, he who resurrects the dead. But usually in their own mind, that's is not thought of, or it's thought of as, uh, often in their own mind, it's not thought of, or it's thought of as, as immortality, some such thing. And I think it's fair to say that the Jewish tradition doesn't focus on that moment and the, on these eschatological events uh, quite as, as uh, centrally as uh, Christianity does, especially in its uh, baptismal theology. But there are some places where they speak of what's characteristic of Olam Abba, of the world to come, excuse me, of the world to come. So, for example, in one of the tractates in the Mishnah, which is an early rabbinic law code put out about the year 200 of the Common Era in the land of Israel when it was under 
uh, the domination and occupation of the Roman Empire. It says about uh, Psalm 92, the psalm for the Sabbath day, it says it's a song for the time to come, for the future time, <coughs> for the day that is all Sabbath, rest in eternal life. <coughs> the day in which, excuse me, in which uh, uh, there will be nothing but Sabbath, in which the cares and demands and so forth of the week, of weekday living uh, have disappeared and have become a, a constant reality. So the Sabbath is a kind of earnest, a kind of anticipation of the world to come. In the Talmud, it also says that the Sabbath is one sixtieth of the world to come. One sixtieth of the world. They tend to count in units of six or sixty or so. We still see this in uh, modern discourse with twenty-four hours of the day and three hundred sixty degrees in the in the circle and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, that the Sabbath is a, is a little miniature uh, of the world to come. You know, there are roughly sixty Sabbaths in a, a, a year, and so it's one sixtieth of the world to come. And then there are statements that living justly and engaging in repentance are at least as valuable, maybe even as the world to come. Living in this world justly and repentantly is as valuable as the world to come, uh, or even redolent of the world to come. The, 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 that, that manner of life manifests in the world to come. So someone who lives that manner of life might be described in rabbinic discourse as ben olam haba, a member of, literally a son of, but a member of uh, the world to come even though they have not yet uh, died. But in general, I don't think you could say that there's the same eschatological focus and so, so much, as much focus on death and rebirth in Judaism, certainly as you have in Christianity. Fantastic. Um, I think we are running out of time, but before we, we, we wrap up, I would like to ask uh, this one last question to both of you. Uh, what are some of the insights that you would like to, you know, or some of our readers are reading your book to pick out as something that is quite important to promote relations between uh, Christians and Jews. Uh, what are the, some of the insights that you would like your, our readers to pick out from this book? You go first. Okay. Give me more time to think of something. <laughs> I, I guess uh, the, the, the principal one, Cliff, is... Um, how deeply shaped uh, Christian views of resurrection were by second Judaism uh, in general, uh, that, that cosmos, its literature, uh, and so forth. Uh, just, just to make one point connected to John's point on the Sabbath, the Eucharist, of course, was also imagined by early Christians and still uh, is to some extent as a kind of foretaste of, of the heavenly banquet uh, about which Isaiah talks in chapter or one of you can tell me right now, is it 26 or uh, later in this? Uh, and uh, certainly I think Jesus of Nazareth talked about, you know, you know, at the Last Supper, not, not banqueting with his disciples uh, until that heavenly banquet. Yeah. Um, so I guess just generally speaking, the reap and interest in which uh, both Christian practice uh, and particularly in, the, you know, prayers of the church and in its sacraments were shaped by uh, Jewish practice and thought. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, as we were writing uh, Resurrection, the Power of God for Christians and Jews, we were interested in dispelling certain misconceptions that a lot of people have about the uh, relationship of uh, Judaism and Christian origins and the Jewishness of Jesus. Uh, there are three or four of which that came to mind. One is the notion of Judaism as somehow corrupt and decadent, that the, that the Jews of Jesus' time were corrupt, decadent, de decadent hypocrites, uh, afflicted with obsessive compuls compulsive disorder, uh, uh, legalists uh, with no sense of spirit and so forth. This is a New Testament polemic, by no means everywhere in the New Testament, New Testament polemic, which I would compare, I wonder what you think of this, Cliff, with the caricatures of Canaanite and Babylonian religion that you have in the Hebrew Bible. When religions are in competition, it's useful, anybody's in competition, it's useful to make the alternative, the competitor, look like an idiot and a horrible uh, human being. And you see this in political discourse, you see this in a, in a, lot, of, a lot of discourse. Uh, so I think that would be the first thing to try to disabuse, uh, uh, a, 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 especially a Christian audience of, about uh, ancient Judaism. And also the notion that the resurrection of the dead, the belief in the resurrection of the dead and the possibility of a hereafter, that originates with Jesus. 
I find that's very commonly believed. It's like, like until then, all you had was some sort of Hebrew Bible, some sort of Old Testament where everybody just died and so on and so on. The, the vitality of the belief of resurrection of the dead, a controversial belief uh, in Second Temple Judaism is, is, is completely missed when people have that assumption. And there's the, the traditionalism of the New Testament, the, the rooting of the New Testament in Second Temple Judaism is something I think needs to be underscored. And um, that means they're underestimating the Jewishness of Jesus and his disciples and the way in which this early Christian literature doesn't just fit into a trajectory from Greek and Roman literature, which to some degree it does, but also uh, fits into a certain certain modes of interpretation that were very much around in, 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 the, in Jewish circles in the first century uh, C. <clears throat> and finally, I, the other thing I think of is the failure to recognize the extent that the New Testament is composed of what we call midrashim, of Jewish interpretations of its of its scripture, midrashim on the Hebrew Bible. And as, as Kevin says, it's the only scripture that the early church knew. They didn't regard what now is called the New Testament as part of scripture originally. Uh, and uh, so the, a, a great deal of New Testament is a kind of recomposition of, of, what, of Hebrew Bible texts using techniques of interpretation that aren't the ones of modern historical critical discourse that you have in modern secular universities. And they aren't just, they aren't plain sense interpretation, they're highly contextual. They're highly imaginative, but imaginative in ways that people who've studied Midrash or have studied modes of interpretation among the sectarians at Qumran, the so-called sectarians of Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, would be very familiar with. So I think generally what we're trying to do is to say, Jews and Christianity are, are quite different in many ways. Uh, they are quite mutually exclusive in many ways but they're interconnected and Christianity is deeply rooted in the Jew in Judaism of its own time. Fantastic. Um, I, I think our audience would have loved that, but unfortunately, this is all we have time for for this episode. And I've greatly enjoyed, uh, you know, listening to you and having a conversation with you. And I, so, I certainly hope our audience back home, um, you know, have felt the same way. Um, before I let you go, I know you guys are always working. I know John, you're working on the book on the Sabbath. Um, you always say that you. That's you know, right. That's right. That's right. I'm working. I'm working on the Sabbath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Kevin, uh, do you have anything um, in the pipeline that you are working on that you? Well, some, <laughs> something just came out of the pipeline. I uh, just finished a book on uh, the attempt of evangelical Christians in the 19th and especially the 20th century uh, to convert Italy, of all places, to evangelical Christianity. Uh, and I talked also about the uh, attempt on the part of the Vatican, uh, uh, which had, of course, joined hands with the fascist government uh, to suppress uh, that effort. So, that, am I correct? The title was "The Popes Against the Protestants." That's it. That's it. Oh, that's nice, right. Yeah. Nice. Uh, that's a very yeah. interesting book, yeah. and, and um, I'm sure they can get it online um, on Amazon or any of the you know book uh, traders. On, on that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. Fantastic. Um, do you have any online presence besides uh, uh, being at Harvard? I don't think so. Uh, John, do I? I'm trying to think if, if we have any online <laughs> no, presence. I don't, I, don't, I don't check sites like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, fantastic. I, I'm sure our, 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 our audience may pick up your book from uh, any of the online traders. And uh, I've certainly enjoyed uh, having you on the show. And uh, as have we. And, um, well, thank you so much for having us, Pastor Cliff. We really enjoyed yes. the conversation. Thank, thank you, you so much, Cliff. Yeah, thank you for, for taking the time. And, I'm, and yeah. until next time, and I hope our audience will keep tuning in and listen to these fantastic conversations that we pre uh, keep bringing out uh, uh, for them. Thank you so much. And have a good thank day. You. Day thank day. you. Thank you so much. Polusa Ministries Bye -bye is a non-profit educational enterprise founded in 2019. The ministry is informed by academic scholarship. At Poluso, we embrace multiple perspectives in our engagement with scripture. We seek to provide non-Christians and Christians from all backgrounds and denominations with resources that provide an honest intellectual engagement with the Bible. We embrace multiple perspectives in fostering a more open, moderate society into the 21st century and beyond.
To ensure that we keep bringing you tough conversations like these, please support our ministry by donating as little as 50 Rand per month. You can find our banking details on our website, pulusoministries.co.za.